are we doing? Richard, good presentation. Um, I do a number of these, not too many I try, but it's quite often easy to be better than many others. They're just, you know, not so great, but I think that's quite hard to follow. It's, it was a great presentation and well done, so thank you. Um, I'm going to tell you uh, something about a company I'm passionate about, and it's Gemfields. But uh, I think you'll, if you come and meet my team and meet my staff, one thing you'll find uh, with Gemfields is that no, none of our team is it just a job. It, it's literally a passion. It's almost an addiction. It's something we love. And how can it not be? We have the privilege of working with these incredibly rare gems and following them all the way down to the market. So uh, Gemfields, just to summarize, it's a fairly complex business. I normally say to investors, it's almost impossible to really get your head around who we are on the first meeting. And, and why is that? Because we're both a mining company and a marketing company, or a mining company and a luxury good. We're not a classical resource company, and we're certainly not a classical retail or luxury company as well. We're also not a mine to market, so I just need to get that right. There have been a few examples of mine to market in, in luxury per se, Harry Winston probably being um, the, the best example where they had the, uh, it was the Aber mine, wasn't it, and the Harry Winston retail. We're a mine and market, so we focus on the two ends of the spectrum, but we certainly hold hands with the entire industry downstream. So uh, for a long time, if people said to me, Ian, in a sentence, explain exactly who Gemfields is, the quickest way to explain it is the De Beers of colored stones. So I grew up in uh, southern Johannesburg, in fact, not far from the De Beers head office. So uh, De Beers and, and diamonds and gems have been in, in, embedded. My dad was involved in the diamond industry most of his life, uh, not De Beers per se. So it's been very close and very dear to me. Um, but if we think about the De Beers of colored stones, what is it really that De Beers did? There were two key components, and a lot of people don't quite realize that. And I think this is summed up in, in this first slide, is it's increasing production and increasing both distribution and demand. And I think those are critically important. Uh, what a lot of people don't realize is pre-Kimberley, and in fact, the further back you go in time, uh, the more valuable, the more revered, the more honored colored stones were, your first luxury goods. So gentlemen, every time you, you have to spoil some important young lady in your life, give me a call and say, Ian, damn it, it was your fault again, So, because we'll take it on the nose. But your first luxury good known to man goes back almost 6,000 years. That's the beginning of recorded history, all the way to the Incas and Aztecs. And what they realized is when it rained, the fields were green and life was good. And when it didn't rain, the fields weren't so green and life wasn't so good. So there was an affiliation. Green had a natural significance. And they saw these shiny green stones. And they associated that as God's presence on earth. And so when you have something that not a food, not a fuel, not a medicine, but is beautiful and it symbolizes God's presence, it has to have value. So there was an inherent value. And then, of course, you come all the way to the first, uh, uh, sorry, if you come to the east on this side, Genghis Khan saw emeralds as a massive store of value. So he was, wherever he went marauding, if he got various other elements, he would give them to his team, but he kept the emeralds for himself. So emeralds were particularly important. And the first lady that got involved was Cleopatra. So she was besotted with emeralds and her slaves. And the emerald mines in Egypt are still available for visits and tours. They're not producing anymore. Um, but she used to bathe in emeralds because they gave her peace and tranquility and so on. So that's a little bit of history. And all the way up, as I say, until about 100 years ago, if you went to a jeweler, and funny enough, you, you should do yourself a favor, they're about to move the London Museum. So you know the one that's in the center in the city? They're about to move to their new presence, uh, premises, and they've got a, a great collection. It's called the Cheapside Hoard. And the Cheapside Hoard was a jeweler on the wall of London at the time of the Fire of London, which is now 500 odd years ago. And the time of the fire, obviously everything came collapsing down. And about 100 years ago, they were doing some building excavations and they discovered they broke through the floor of this jeweler and they found the jewelry. And guess what? And I like to stress this because I always like to remember, you've got a few southerners here, you know, between Australia, is it, or New Zealand and South Africa, so we'll forgive ourselves up front. But so often today, England's jewelry choices are quite conservative. But if you look at the Cheapside Hoard, it's 99% colored stones. And if you look at the crown jewels, it's predominantly colored stones. You know, colored stones played a very significant history uh, and part of it. So really, and as I say, that was all the way up till Kimberley. And what happened with Kimberley, pre-Kimberley, all of the jewelers had to have emeralds and they had to have rubies and they had to have sapphires and amethysts and tourmalines and spinels. Because without that, you didn't have production because somebody found a mine 
They would mine it out and then they'd move on. So you had to have a little bit of everything. And what Kimberley did, it was the first mine that gave large volumes of production on a continuous basis. And that allowed the creation of the diamond industry because unless you've got confidence in supply, you can't really build an industry. So that's where Kimberley came along. And so from that point of view, Gemfields does the same thing. We actively focus on looking for new sources of supply. And right now within the resource sector, we're probably unique, not too many miners at all, especially over the last three, four, five years are focusing on actually getting more supply to the market. So we do that extensively. And then of course on the distribution and, and the marketing, we're also actively involved because that's the next kicker. So the first thing that De Beers did well is actually ensuring consistent supply. And the next thing we all know that did very well is post 1945s. And again, this is something most people don't know, but the diamond as the engagement ring of choice only started in the 1940s. Before that, a very small percentage, the one or two or three percentiles used to give the diamond ring, but the vast majority of people gave the wedding band. And for the engagement, you gave what today is called the kitchen tea, the things to use in the house. And they decided they wanted to change that and they came with a diamond is forever. And a diamond is a girl's best friend. And the three stone ring, yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And the millennium stone, a thousand years past for a thousand years to come. And as I say those, you all remember those. And they did an incredibly good job until 1998, because up until 1998, they had an agreement with a rose of the Russian producers. So 70% of the world's diamond supply was going through them. And as a result, they were happy to market and promote it. But in 1908, they stopped that loss and they stopped marketing. And sadly for them, and great for us, is diamond retail demand and diamond retail prices have flatlined for the last 50, 17 years now. In fact, total of 5% growth in diamond demand, while rough prices have climbed more than 35%. So if your retail prices is only climbing five and your rough prices is climbing 35, that means your margins are eroded. And you go and talk to people in, 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 in India, in your, uh, what's it, not Sitapura, where they do all the cutting, uh, Surat and you talk to all your diamond guys, for a while they were able to compensate by better recoveries from the diamonds, but they're really struggling, and that's where colored stones. So just a quick summary, and I'll leave it on that one. Where are our mines operated? Gemfield's focuses, our focus is specifically on emeralds at the moment, uh, rubies and amethyst, this is our mines, and we're exploring into sapphires. We in Zambia, I'll sh show you soon, we've got the Kajum emerald mine, we own that 75% and the government of Zambia owns 25%. In Kajum, we've also got the Kariba Amethyst Mine. Um, and there, I'll, I'll give you the numbers for the others, but we produce about 40% of the world's amethyst, an incredible stone. Historically, one of the rare gems. And again, I'll, De Beers did a lot of good things. They did a few naughty things. They came up with the terminology precious and semi-precious. And when one person says it loud and everyone else says nothing, it becomes fact. The gemstone industry today has rejected that. That doesn't exist anymore. But in the minds of consumers, it's hurt them a little bit. But if you go throughout history, collections, amethyst was a very important stone with religious connotations. So, but that's an opportunity to come. So, and then Mozambique, we've got the ruby mine exploring in Colombia. We've done some work in Brazil before, uh, Sri Lanka, a little bit of work as well. Our head office is in London. We've recently found some incredibly exciting uh, emerald deposits in Ethiopia. So you'll see a trend along you know, the, the east coast of Africa because the continental plates, that was very volatile. And of course, we also own the Fabergé brand as part of our marketing. So that's really our locations. So short term, I'm going to come from a, a short term point of view. If we looked at the numbers before, they were incredible. They were absolutely amazing. Jim feels long term over the last seven years we've been running. We've done incredibly well. Our share price has gone from 2p to about 40p in a seven year period. And uh, I don't want to overstress this one, but I'd, I'd like to meet the CEO that says their company's overvalued. I think we'll all say we're undervalued. But gem feels is the value of my, the near cash value of my stock equals my market cap. And I'll explain why. And my hard assets come free. So we're super undervalued, but that's because we're rebuilding an industry and our focus is not just on our business. Right now, gem feels focus is on the rebuilding of the jewelry industry. And I'll say the whole thing. For a while I said colored stone, but right now, the diamond industry and the jewelry industry need us as much as, as the rest because we provide modern margin, we provide selling opportunity, et cetera, et cetera, I'll explain. And you can see, so 
Short term, we were affected in India. Those of you who have been following global trends, uh, we were about to have two very big auctions in December, a big emerald auction and a big ruby auction. And just before there was the demonetization policy. So that our customers had cash, everything with us is very transparent. Our customers set aside the money to buy my emeralds and rubies but they had cash in their business they used to play this small supplies, some of their staff, etc. And suddenly some of that was less valuable. So they asked us to delay it. So we've now pushed it on. And if you think that Gemfields is the only mining company that I know that is a price maker, we're not a price taker because we're not a commodity and demand is picking up as I'll show you, why sell your product when your customer doesn't, is not ready for it and when you don't need to and when you know the price is going up. In terms of the longer term price, you can see at the bottom there is our average selling price for our emeralds. We were selling at about, uh, this was a high quality emeralds, about $4.40 in 2009 and now we're selling about 65. We hit 70 the year before last and I'll be sure we'll come back. I'll explain a bit of that before. That's our higher quality emeralds. Our volume weighted blended average price has gone from about 50 cents to $7.50 within that period of time and that's because of marketing and demand and ensuring supply, everything else. Just quickly, to show you global emerald, ruby, sapphire market, this is in terms of your imports of those products in jewelry form, has increased 213% in, since 2009. So you can see a massive increase in global demand for colored stone products. Your consumer uh, demand is still extremely strong and growing. Uh, and your big jewelers, if you go down Bond Street and do yourself a favor if you don't believe me, 2009 you walk down Bond Street, the windows of the jewelry stores are white diamonds, white diamonds, white diamonds, white diamonds. Today go look at the windows, 50% is color. And I know because I walked through yesterday, just purely per chance. That doesn't mean the value of their stock is 50% because they're sitting on a lot of old diamond stock they want to move, but you put in the window, the thing is going to attract your customer and then you use very clever staff to move where you, you need to move at that point in time. But you can see an incredible increase. Just to show you how, to, to, to how serious I am there, that uh, is L L Tiffany's. Just three weeks ago, there was the American Super Bowl and uh, Tiffany's, who was one of the most conservative jewelry stores. Most people don't know, but 70% of Tiffany's sales is sterling silver. So they really only want to sell the blue box, but they're a big brand and they're well recognized and they invented the uh, solitaire diamond. And it was about a single diamond in a single setting, and that's what their mark was. They just uh, announced Lady Gaga, like it or don't like it, as their new creative director. Why? Because they're recognizing the new consumer, the young millennial, your children, want uniqueness, they want individuality, they want creativity, and the stores need to sell something different to generate margin. Because if you know the price of the diamond and you know the price of the gold and you've got a boring setting, how do you ever deliver margin? You're in trouble if you don't. That's going to be in our presentation. That's our breakdown in terms of auction revenues and per carat prices. But if you look at the bottom, you can see a steady increase in prices for our emeralds. Our rubies is bounced around, but that's because it's very new. Rubies was only coming out of Burma, and overnight we've suddenly producing 70% of the world's rubies. So we, we're just doing a bit of school fees and we're not rushing. Where are our operations? We'll start on our foundation mine, the Kajem Emerald Mine. So this is in Zambia. It's 43 square kilometers. We own 75% and the government of Zambia owns 25. This is a 50 year old mine. It was parastatal, it was run by the government. It was bankrupt its whole life. Never made a profit, individuals made a profit. When we took over at the end of 2008, we owed 40 million to the tax man, 20 million to suppliers and 10 million to our staff. Within a very short while, we were able to settle that. And in the last three years, we're the only mining company in Zambia that's paid tax on profits. Now, if you know Zambia, you know there's a lot of copper guys that make a lot of money. And yet this tiny little mine, and in the last 15 years, only two of us have made any, paid any tax on profits. That's us and First Quantum. So from a bankrupt mine, when run, right, you can make a significant difference. A number of employees there has gone from 200 employees to over 1,000. We invest heavily, I'll show you a little bit later, into schools and clinics. And whenever we mark, we mark Zambian emeralds and Mozambican rubies when we mark it. And we promote the country, we promote tourism, and we make a significant social difference to the countries where we work, and we pride ourselves in terms of ethics. Um, that mine has got six known emerald bearing deposits. We're currently, and I might have a pointer, but it's easier just to walk over. Six known, we're predominantly mining this one called the Chama Pit. This is two miles in strike. It dips two miles into the ground. We've drilled all of it, but we've done a resource statement only on 800 meters. 
And that 800 meters has both a proven and a probable reserve of uh, it's a billion carats in the ground. And it's, it, at the time of doing this statement, it was 500 million NPV. So that was the value of that. Um, today, it's about 650 million because they've changed the tax regime much more favorably to the mine. And that's less than half of that asset. So we talk about undervalued. You can see there's an incredible asset sitting right there in Cargem. 20 years, minimum life of mine. We produce between 20 and 30 million carats a year. I'll go on to that one. One of the reasons why your bigger mines have never moved into colored stones is it's a very challenging geology. And while we have in Gemfields these incredible assets of emeralds and rubies and amethysts, the other asset we've got, which I need to mention, is our team. We've probably got the most competent uh, colored stone team in the world. And you can see that it's, it's a very complex geology, but in terms of the consistency, it's improving. It's moving upwards and upwards. This next mine is a brand new mine. This is in northern Mozambique, right up near Pemba, off the coast of Pemba. They recently discovered oil and gas. At this mine, the rubies was only discovered in 2009. We own 75% and our partners own 25%. We met our partners at the end of 2011 and we acquired 75% of the asset. We spent 2012 convert converting their hunting concession into a mining concession. We spent 2013 putting roads, power supply, water. To date, we've invested just over 100 million into that asset, including acquisition costs, including CapEx, including OPEX. And we've already got 250 or uh, 225 million re return. So in a really short space of time, we've got twice back that we've come out. Those of you who know mining know that's nearly impossible. I, I don't quite, well, I might have it, no, I don't have it on that slide, but I just want to show you. So this is our mine here. We've done a resource statement on 10%. We've got a total in this mine, Montepuez, 360 square kilometers. We've since acquired another 400 square kilometers from a, a neighboring area. So we've got over eight, almost 800 square kilometers. Our resource statement covers 36. And that gives you a 21 year life of mine on the, on the basis of ramping up our current 10 million carats up to 20 million carats a year. So significant ramp up. We've also drilled another 10% and that gives us an MPV of a billion dollars. So we know there's $2 billion right there. So straight up, there's an incredible asset and we're doing it really, really well. Right now, just quickly back to the other numbers. Zambia, we produce between 20 and 30 million carats. That is 30, 20 and 30% of the world supply. So total emerald production in the rough, about 100 million carats a year. Average recovery from rough to cut and polished for emeralds is only 5%. And that's important, because that means only 5 million carats of cut and polished emeralds are produced every year, while 50 million carats of cut and polished diamonds are produced every year. So if you were worried about rarity, emeralds are much rarer. In terms of rubies, we produce two thirds, 75% odd. We produce 10 million carats a year, and the next biggest other producer, which is Burma, is about 5 million. So already we've doubled that. Your average recovery is only 15%, so you've got about 2 million carats. So one of the challenges with rubies, we've already trebled total supply. Such a rare stone. Historically, most rubies went from Burma to Bangkok to China. And everything you can do with a diamond, you can do with a ruby, because they're hard, they're durable, etc. They don't have fractures. Um, so that's an incredible asset. As I said, a 21-year life of mine minimum. And then over and above that, exploring in Ethiopia, Colombia, Sri Lanka, and various other sites around the world. On top of that, we also own the Fabergé brand. Why do we own the Fabergé brand? Because we're a mining company that markets. And in 2009, we were doing extremely well. Sorry, we acquired this in 2013. So at that stage, we were doing very well in terms of marketing and promoting and increasing demand for color from the high street down. But at that stage, when I went to the Chanel's and the Cartier's and the Tiffany's of the world, they were doing two things. They were either very diamond focused or they were all moving into handbags and shoes and perfumes and watches because they weren't making money. And I told them, if you use colored stones, you can create differentiation, you can create margin, and you can create more sales. And they wouldn't listen. So my simple thing as a, as a stubborn South African, if they won't listen, we'll lead. I'm very pleased to tell you today, every single one of those brands is using more and more color. And almost all of them is ordering. We don't. We're a mining company that markets, but a lot of them place orders with Gemfields, who then replaces the order with our customer, so we can underwrite the ethics, the social commitment, the route to market, etc. So Fabergé is part of our marketing wing. Finally, what else have we done? And this is something that De Beers did was really easy is that we created a, a grading system for our rough, and any given time, we keep a year's worth of supply. 
And that's what I said. So our total value of our stock in emeralds and rubies at cost of production plus Fabergé goods is about 70 odd million dollars. 100, 100 million dollars, sorry. And the net realizable value of that, if we took it to auction, is at minimum of three or four times more, but we're normally getting five or six times more. In other words, the cost uh, of production of our emeralds at the moment is, Janet, my CFO is there. Yeah, pageant is $1.50. Yeah, and we're selling at seven fifty. dollars Yeah. Rubies, $2.50. We're selling so, there we are. So I could have given those numbers, but I would have rounded them down, but it's not you now that she'll give them exactly. So how do we do it? We've created a rough grading system, and we're able to get volume. So no longer do you buy one emerald if you're a, a, a jeweler or two or three. You can buy 5,000, 6,000 or 10,000 emeralds of the same size, shape and color. And why is that important? Because all of a sudden you can get economies of scale and Gemfields is leading with advertising and that means the market can follow because you won't add one page in Vogue magazine, $90,000. Open every Vogue, Louis Vuitton has seven pages or six pages because they're a $40 billion business selling plastic. That's not because they're doing a bad job, it's because the jewelry industry has done a shocking job. But when you create leadership and you create opportunity to, to monetize and scale, it follows. So right now you open your average magazine and right now you'll probably find as many color stone adverts as you will find diamonds where a short while ago you didn't see any. And that's because we bring in the product through. We sell on auction, I won't worry too much. We do a lot of advertising and marketing and we're getting incredible results. We run every single penny as if it's our own. So just to show you, De Beers and the Diamond Producers Association, they put together $6 million, they took a year, and they came up with a new campaign, Rare is Real. If you haven't seen it, it's almost anti-engagement, it's for commitments, everything but traditional commitments. We saw a small opportunity, and through Fabergé, we came up with Say Yes in Color. It cost us $20,000 in a month, not $6 million in a year, and we've had significantly more hits. And this is Ruby-inspired stories. If you look into Google, et cetera, or YouTube, you'll see them. They're really cool, playing on BA before all the flights, et cetera. And then finally, because I am over time, am I? Okay, ready into questions, but I'll try, because this is critically important for GEM Fields, is our corporate social responsibility and our investment into our communities. We invest 1.5% uh, minimum of revenue into our communities. That's our minimum commitment. And building schools, building roads, building clinics, Farming projects is vitally important. All of our projects are very remote. If you come to our mines, you eat organic food. Why? Because we've got local farmers that are farming the vegetables that would come straight to our mine. It works for us, it works for them, because we buy it from them at market prices. But they're on our doorstep rather than us having to go 100 miles to the market. So it works for us and it works to them and it works extremely well. So I'm super proud. But more importantly, and then I'll kind of finish and I'll just stop on the numbers after this, but both Zambia and Mozambique. Mozambique's a great example. That deposit was only discovered in 2009. And in the northern province where we are, we have been gotten an award for being the single biggest employer in that province. We're the single biggest taxpayer in that province. We got an award for being the most transparent taxpayer in the entire country. Because we have the taxman with us all the time because these are national heritage goods. And we're the second biggest export out of that country, which is both very encouraging and very frightening when you know the needs of Mozambique and you think a relatively small company like ours plays such a big role. It's, as I say, it's nice to be there, but that company, country needs more and we need to go further. Just quickly onto that, so we produce 30 million carats of emeralds a year. De Beers produces 30 million carats of diamonds a year. Our revenue from emeralds is about 100 million a year. Theirs from diamonds is 6 billion a year, but ours is much rarer. But our growth is much faster because our product deserves better and it's being recognized as that. If you really, there's nothing wrong with diamonds, ladies, they're great. But emeralds, rubies, and sapphires are not secondary to them. They are equal to them and the world is waking up. And as I said, your young millennial wants rarity, et cetera. Finally, our half year numbers, you will see when you compare to the previous half year, just quickly 51 million revenue against 94. That was because we delayed one significant auction and halved another one. We don't have to panic about that because the value is in our goods. It sits in our stock. China, those of you who think China's had a hard time, it's not stabilizing. It is picking up really fast. Look at steel prices, gone from $40 to $80. A lot of that driven by China. Russia, I've been there recently, picking up really well. The US is picking up extremely well. So uh, we've had three big jewelry stores or gems uh, markets this year, Tucson, Bangkok, and Hong Kong. All of my customers are asking when's our next auction. So we did the right call on that. Uh, net profit after tax, just our EBITDA margin in a sustainable basis is plus 
Um, and last year we did a 26 million net profit. Um, after tax, the, the EBITDA at the moment is a bit less. It's around about a 45%, but that's because we invest heavily in growth. So we've got two producing mines, which is Montepuez, Cargem, Amethyst as well, but that's covering its own way. And then we're investing heavily in Ethiopia, Sri Lanka, Colombia, Fabergé, which is growing. So we're a company that's committed to growth because we see ourselves as the De Beers and we will be that in the not too distant future. Thank you. That's it from me. Thank you very much, Ian. And um, we've got Thank you. just a few minutes for questions. Um, lady here at the front, please. I like your adverts at the Curzon. I think they're very good. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank Question. you. You mentioned twice the word millennials. Yes. And I, I read um, De Beers' study last year yes. on millennials' attitude yes. to diamonds. And of course, De Beers are saying that millennials like diamonds, yes. although Bain and RBC are not yeah. that convinced. Have you done something similar for coloured stones, number one? Yeah. And two, can you comment on those sort of dedicated um, jewellery cable channels like Rocks and yes. Co, like how oh, much they're selling? Okay, so here's the issue. So exactly right. I was at a function in Miami with a diamond panel. We were there and they were asking that question. And funny enough, one of the diamond CEOs came to me afterwards and he said to me, and you know, it was, because we were having a little chat between us, said, one of our problems, you look at that panel, and we're all 50 plus, and most of us are minors. And your new millennials is young and trendy, and we're trying to tell them what they are, but we're not there ourselves. So I talk about millennials cautiously, because it, you, know, you need a millennial to tell you who they are. But certainly what we have found, and we've done a lot of studies, is a millennial is going back. They want value, they want meaning, they want lasting experience. And that's what De Beers is telling you. If you look at Rare is Real, it's about that rare and real experiences and they're saying diamonds are there. What I give kudos to the diamond industry is their marketing used to be diamonds are forever. And diamonds, now they're talking inclusive. Because if rare is important, so is ours. And we've certainly found millennials want individuality and a unique experience and there's nothing better than color. The other thing with your millennials, and we'll all know this, is if a mom wears a conservative skirt, millennials wear a very short one. And if a dad wears normal pants, a millennial wears his halfway down his bottom, okay? Because they want to be different. Doesn't mean it's cool, but it's ugly. But, and when a millennial opens mommy's jewelry box, what does she find? White diamonds. So what does she compensate? She puts tattoos on. Now those are silly things in my opinion, but a wonderful way for them to showcase the individuality with a lasting memory is colored stones. And, we see, and it's achievable price because our price point right now is way undervalued. And that means they can get that little emerald or ruby at a much lower price point and that's really valuable. So we've seen incredible demand. And the cable channels are great. Most people don't know, the largest retailer of diamonds in the world, who can tell me who it is? Walmart. Because every single mine produces hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of really small stones. We need them. That's the accessibility. This is the aspiration. Your table channels fit in right there. I don't, nothing wrong with them. It's a hard job because you can get $50 little emerald earrings and half of them go back because you wear them on the week and send them back on a Monday. So, but they tell a great story because the one thing cable does better than any, you've got you fixated. And they don't just sell the product. They come to the mine and they show about the rarity. And they add value. There's a place to pay. We, all of our miners mine lots of that every single day of the week, so, okay. Gentleman here. Hi, so I have a question about like your certainty in terms of uh, the cycle of the colored gem stones, yes. because uh, you compare it to the diamonds over here since like the 1940s. How are you certain that the demand for the colored stone will be like, keep growing, 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 and not go into like a cycle like in fashion, when you compare with the brands from LVMH, it's going to cycle, like are you not like, expecting a decrease in demand in like, let's say five, 10 years and then a drop, substantial drop in demand for like 30 years and then come back yeah. to fashion? If you cycle, so look, bottom line, diamonds, so if we're talking, Kimberley started 100 years ago, but you know, 1940s was when diamonds really took off, as I said. That's a 50 odd year cycle. A 50 year cycle when you, you're mining, uh, you're making 6 billion and your industry is 12 billion from 200 million, uh, most of us in this room will take it, hey? 20 years where our share price has quadrupled, we'll take it. But the bottom line, what Diamonds has showed us, it is a cycle when you drive it for a while and sit back and do nothing. But as long as you recognize that your gems are inherently valuable, but not, you cannot rely on that alone, you have to message it. Because if you don't, Louis Vuitton is messaging plastic at an incredible rate. So the best example is French wine and gems. And I'm going to use you. French wine, how long has it been around? Is it a cycle? No, it fluctuates a little bit in time, but it's not a cycle. And gemstones, you have to, all you have to do is go to any country where overnight they would choose to choose a site. India is a great example. Germany is a great example. Israel is a great example. Historically, there has never 
been an example of greater liquid wealth than gemstones. And everything else is important, but those are nice to have because your houses are nice, your shares are nice, and your cars are nice. But if you have to overnight go somewhere, there's nothing better than gemstones. And that's not cyclical. We've got okay. time for one final question, gentlemen, from the front here, Pete. In terms of, you, you explained earlier on about uh, Tiffany's yeah. example of using Lady Gaga. Yeah. Are you actually marketing it to companies like that in terms of wholesale sales to them? And what procedures are you taking to increase that, if you are? So we're a mining company that markets. We sell our rough to beneficiators, which is the same as diamonds. Doesn't matter who tells you what, nine out of 10 diamonds in the world are cut and polished in India because highly skilled people at very competitive labor costs. So nine out of 10 with the balance being cut in New York and uh, Germany and Israel. Antwerp is just a trading center now. So that's really where they cut. And our emeralds are exactly the same. So we sell to cutting manufacturers who are highly skilled. We help them sell onto manufacturers, but a lot of them are manufacturers. And we help them sell onto the big brands. So we, would, we hold the whole channel and we stimulate with some generic marketing. So sometimes it's just emeralds, Rubies, sapphires, and you'll see a small little gem fields, but just re-stimulating awareness for the product. Because the moment you think about it, you cannot look into it and not know how rare it is. And then a few of the companies will co-brand. So Showpod is very committed to ethics. And there'll be gem fields and Showpod. George Jensen and gem fields. Amrapali, uh, uh, Bergdorf Goodman and gem fields. They were committed to ethics and we underwrite it. There are a few of the other big bands I won't tell you, but they use our product, but they think their name is bigger. So it's only their name. But if you ask, how do I know this is ethical? They would say it's gem fields. But of their product, because we're you know, relatively young and we're only 30% of emeralds, not all of it's in emeralds, but if you ask, they can give it to you if that's important to you. Okay. okay.